On to a uh, discussion panel. So as many of you would know, uh, learning analytics has been a focus of ours at, at Moodle. And about March this year, we introduced the open solution, uh, learning analytics with uh, Project Inspire. So with your help, we've worked through phase one and we've collected valuable data. And in May, the first public release of Inspire as a third party plugin was made available. And that coincided with the Moodle release 3.3. Um, in 3.4, the Inspire system will become part of Moodle Core, uh, making it automatically available to all Moodle sites, whether locally managed, partner hosted, or hosted on Moodle Cloud. So today, uh, for our learning analytics panel discussion, uh, we have from Moodle HQ, Damien, Tom, and Martin, and Grant Beavers from Moodle Rooms, Andrew Bogue from Catalyst, and they'll provide some more updates and take some questions and share about the latest projects and the learning analytics within Moodle. Thanks guys. Hello. <laughs> I'll kick off. Okay. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Rowan. Uh, so Rowan just mentioned uh, Inspire, but th there are many, many forms of analytics uh, that we can cover today. Lots of different projects. Uh, uh, in Moodle and out of Moodle, and uh, so um, I thought we'd just all have a little spiel here. A little chin wag. Um, so let me tell you a bit about the history of in analytics in Moodle. The very, very first module that I wrote um, in the very beginning, so Moodle just had one module, and it was the survey module. Uh, and that's all you could do was analytics, pretty much. There was nothing else. <laughs> um, so that survey module that no one likes to use because they can't change the questions uh, was a very specifically designed um, collection of surveys, like the COLIS, the Constructivist Online Learning Environment uh, Survey, uh, which was designed as an analytic tool to understand what the group of students in your class were doing, how they were performing, and how they were feeling. And by diving into the, uh, the graphs and the results of that survey, you could really see immediately outliers, and you could find particular students who are struggling in some way, and you could zoom in on them and then go and talk to them. And in the very beginning, when Moodle was only that survey, it was used in companion with other ways of teaching. So you might have a face-to-face -face class and you would give them this survey or uh, you'd be teaching on, a, I don't know, a mailing list or something and you would give them this survey. Um, so it's sort of interesting that that was there right from the beginning um, and there's a, a collection of other survey tools in there as well. And in the very first Moodle course that was ever, I used to run that analytic every week. So it's to put the students through that survey uh, every week, sometimes twice a week. And it was just this constant feedback of trying to understand where they were at and then modifying my teaching uh, for, the, for the following week. Um, so that's a historical thing. Now there's other tools in Moodle still uh, to do with uh, um, analyzing uh, what students are doing and trying to give you some uh, something to act on as a teacher, as, a, as an educator. Um, I'll probably leave some of those, maybe maybe these guys want to talk about some of those too, but uh, I don't know, who wants to go next? Who wants to say something? Okay, cool. Thanks, Martin. And um, hi, everyone. Um, I, you know, the, the definition of analytics is, is wide and varied in, in, in different institutions that we work with. and. And I suppose if I look back at last year, and, and to a certain extent this year, but last year, I mean, I, I can't think of any institution that, that Blackboard or Moodle Rooms works with that wasn't doing some sort of analytics project. I think if we added all of the dollar value of, of all of these projects, we could we could probably feed you know a few different nations um, quite easily. Uh, the amount of effort that's going into that. And I, and I think a lot of that's driven by the fact that, you know, there's a lot of re regulatory change going on in the sector. Um, there is a greater need to report to government about various things that are going on. Um, the way in which we're funded, especially in the vet sector going forward, and, and certainly, you know, that will flow into higher ed, um, is requiring us to ensure that we see our students through to completion. So as a result of that, 
you know, we're wanting to use the analytics to, to track retention rates, to identify students at risk and, uh, you know, and, and be able to, I think, probably do a much better job, in, in all honesty, certainly in the vet sector, uh, you know, around ensuring that we've done the very best that we possibly can to identify students before they become problems. And so I think the emphasis on, on analytics as a tool to allow us to do that um, is, is probably, you know, m more important than it's probably ever been. And so, you know, I, I say to a lot of people, a analytics for the sake of analytics is just data. If it, We need to have some sort of call to action around that analytics and, and be able to, you know, take that analytical data and then be able to act on it straight away. And we want the tools to allow us and help us to act on that as well. Um, and, and we're starting to see a lot of those sort of tools in built into learning management systems. You know, I'm hoping that's something Inspire is, is kind of like doing, is, is not only collecting this data in a way that's meaningful for us to do something with, but, but is also allow, is going to allow us to then reach out to the relevant people that are going to allow us to take action with respect to that data. Um, we're doing a lot of work, certainly in Middle Rooms and Blackboard, we're doing a lot of work around what we call at, at the point analytics. So we, we at Blackboard we talk about big A analytics and little A analytics. The big A analytics is the is the BI, you know, the big data warehouses where we're sucking data in from all around uh, all of the applications we've got in our institution and where we're crunching that data and we're spitting reports out for management and, and whoever needs them. The little A analytics we talk about is that those analytics at the point where it's happening inside a course. So if we've got a discussion forum or an assignment or a quiz, can I there and then click into that environment and see some meaningful analytics about who's doing what, where they're doing it, who's having trouble, who's not having trouble, as opposed to kind of like the old style of going out of the system, going into a reporting structure, running a report, getting that information, printing it out or exporting it somewhere and then doing something with that data. So I think you know, we're, we're investing a lot of time in that little A analytics work, making sure that whenever you need that data and whenever you need to get access to it, it's there when you need it, not having to go looking for it. And I think, you know, that's where we should be focusing our time because the time it just takes to chase that data down and then do something with it, y we could be spending our time doing a lot more useful things. And uh, yeah, so I'll pass on. Thanks very much. Uh, look, I'm really interested in this topic personally, and we've spent a lot of time talking with clients and amongst ourselves, and you know, hypothesising about what data analytics means and 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 you know what we could use it for. Uh, look, I was really impressed with the middle rooms uh, sort of dashboard that you guys just de demonstrated. I suppose. <laughs> Data analytics at this stage has two broad applications in a learning sense, and there will be more and there are others, but from what I sense is this whole idea that both Martin and Grant mentioned of custodial care, right? Being able to detect when someone needs a pat on the back, some help, support, you know, that's, there's very real reasons why institutions need that, right? I mean, at the very least, the finance from a revenue leakage point of view because, you know, they want students at start to finish. Uh, and the other end of the spectrum, the, certainly from what we've seen in a wish list from our clients is this idea of you know learning analytics that allows us to improve the, the the educational methodology that we use or the questions that we ask or the quizzes that we deliver or some meaningful feedback saying we need to change this in a course or we need to use this and that's I think I think at this stage a little bit harder because it's just got more data points and there's a little bit more subjectivity about you know what ha, how you measure these things etc and some food for thought around learning analytics, because often these things can be really massive from an organisational uh, point of view, and, they, and the tool set itself costs a million bucks, and there's a huge procurement process around it. But you can do so much with so little if you look at analytics, especially in the custodial care um, component, if you look at these things like collaboratively and iteratively, like you can do a lot of damage with the right data in an Excel spreadsheet and someone who's pretty keen to find the answer to some questions. If you really do socialise the outcomes of what you discover and you, and you iteratively look at what starts falling out of it and ask new questions. Now if you get that flow happening with any kind of analytical process, you're doing well, right? And that's, certain, that, that's something to bear in mind before, um, sometimes before organisations launch into huge processes you know, in search of this analytics tool, is to really think, well, come on, let's just see what we can do with a little bit, with people who are, with stakeholders that are really interested and motivated, and, and know their way around a few tools. 
Then I suppose another bit of food for thought I'll just throw in there, because this is such a big topic, and I think I'm really interested to know the questions you guys are gonna ask, is there are some tools set aside, um, what you wanna see aside, it's quite quick that we've seen you know, you bump into some issues that are challenging for universities. Well, I talk about universities. Uh, for example, one of our clients who we've we've got a, we've had a number of engagements with on on analytics outputs. You know, they, they're talking about it was more custodial care focused. Actually, their outcomes at the beginning. I mean, they wanted to look after their their students and sort of detect the outlying students. And there was a discussion around attendance of tutorials. Right. So, from your organisations here, who tracks attendance to tutorials? Okay, so less, n less, more often not to track these things. Now, I understand. I went to quite a few meetings about the mechanics and uh, should we and shouldn't we and how do we do it and all these sorts of things. So I was present in these discussions and I can understand why it isn't a no-brainer. But from, if you're talking about your ability to ask the question, does people going to tutorials correlate to success or failure, you need that data point, right? And, that, and from the outside as an engineer, who I don't work in universities, you know, I, I, sort of see that, I sort of thought, well, of course you want that data, right? But as you can well understand, sometimes those questions and sometimes those things get really complicated organizationally. So that, that's an ongoing challenge that sort of has nothing to do with the, with the technical choice, um, but is, is very real in order, giving, in order to give you the data points that you need to provide you with sort of pr predictive outcomes. <laughs> Um, so I think it's all I'm going to say because there's, there's other people up on stage and I'm really interested in, in hearing what you guys are going to ask. Hi, uh, I'm a, the, a developer, Moodle developer. Um, so uh, from our point of view, uh, what we've been focusing on recently is this project Inspire. So the whole um, idea about that is that it's sort of designed, we're building an open API and we want to collaborate with um, the community in as much of an open research uh, type of way as we can. So we've built a really good um, platform where we can take in uh, all these data points and then feed them into something uh, and then get predictions out the end. So we're trying to generate meaningful insights. The insights get sent directly to uh, somebody who they're relevant to, and that person then has a meaningful action that they can take uh, based on that insight, and they can see where it's come from and they can see the data. Now, the thing that generates the in insights in our particular case is interesting to me because I'm a, um, a tech nerd kind of person, and it's about machine learning. Uh, so we can interact, integrate with um, TensorFlow, which is an open source machine learning library from Google, uh, and it's really powerful, and it's getting uh, used in all sorts of different places in the world now um, to generate all sorts of uh, crazy things uh, because it works so well. Uh, so um, it's really interesting from that machine learning side uh, to see how much progress we've made in the last few years. And the idea behind it is that um, we don't know in advance what kinds of things are going to be the predictors uh, for the insights that we're interested in. Uh, but what we can do is we can hypothesize and we can say, um, this thing, it might be useful. Let's create an indicator that can calculate a, a data point uh, based on the raw log data in Moodle and any of the Moodle database tables and um, there's lots and lots of raw information in Moodle but we want to try and get some meaning out of that data so we can then we can take the raw data we can calculate uh, an indicator and feed it into this machine learning engine and see if it can predict something the machine learning engine might say uh, no, that, that information is ir irrelevant, but it will kind of work that out itself, which is why it's very interesting. Uh, and then at the end, it'll be able to say, um, uh, based on the, it can only work with the data that's given. So the more data you give it, the more accuracy it will predict things. Uh, and so then it will be able to sort of say, with a percentage of confidence that it's actually predicted an insight. And when that accuracy goes up high enough, that might be something that we're interested in sending a notification to a specific teacher or a student who can act on that data. Um, we want to be very careful about uh, sending predictions uh, that make themselves true. Like, we don't want to tell a student that they're doing terribly and they're going to fail. Um, we want to, we should be sending that kind of notification that a student 
might uh, be in trouble to somebody who can step in and look at the data and make a real decision about what to do about it. Um, so, uh, yep, so that's from me. I'll hand over to Tom. How many of you come from schools that have evaluations at the end of each term or semester for the teacher? Yep, I used to do that. Um, how many of you have schools where there's a process where that data is analyzed and some meaningful steps are taken from the feedback that we received from our students? Cool. Yeah, that's not true for everyone. Um, there's, there's, there's a big black hole um, on information that we gather from our students frequently. Uh, it takes a culture change to think of that information, which is very meaningful. I like you using the word meaningful, um, because we have to make meaningful change based on what we learn about ourselves and what we learn about our learning and what we learn about our, our students. So when on Monday, Joey comes to class and spends two hours in Moodle, and then Tuesday logs in and spends four hours in Moodle, and on Wednesday spends three hours in Moodle, and on Thursday fails a quiz miserably and then doesn't log in for six more days. You know, we have to find out what meaningful things we can do, um, whether that's reaching out to him, um, uh, thinking about what we did there with the quiz, um, thinking about um, a number of variables which are hard to think about, um, but worthy of it. So I'm on this panel because I'm, I'm really interested in the impact of this new knowledge that we're going to be able to collect. And culturally, wondering about the readiness of our organizations to, to listen to that meaningful data and make meaningful change. Well, that was cool. Thank you. Uh, it's open to anyone who wants to ask a question or have an observation or a thought or something that you know, some news. And uh, well, let's just follow where this meandering discussion takes us. We'll need some microphone runners. OK, we've got how many? One, two, OK. 73. <laughs> uh, one thing I really like is seeing data presented visually uh, in different patterns and, you know, different people interpret visual data in different ways depending on what it is they're trying to ascertain. Um, I find that Moodle's not that good at presenting patterns, the data patterns visually. Can you make any comments on that? Um, sure. It probably could be better, of course. Uh, there are graphs and like logs, you know, basic stuff like that. But uh, yeah, pattern identification is definitely something Inspire is going to be good at. Um, we've been doing a lot of work with um, Shiny technology. I don't know if many of you are familiar with that, but the ability to really interact with the data. So bring the data into a tabular form to start with and then really start to interact with the graph, change the parameters of the graph, zoom in on parts of that. If you've got very large cohorts, looking at large cohort data in a graph can, can be quite problematic because of the size and so forth, so that ability. So. Um, you know, I, I love it. I, the, the technology looks great. I, I'm, I'm, I'm understanding that it's a standard for the way in which we, we make more graphical stuff more interactive. Um, but I think, you know, dashboards dashboards are becoming the, the, the way in which we're presenting that data. And, and then the ability to, to then get to the raw data is, is kind of like the secondary thing a lot with, with a lot of that sort of stuff. But I think we're seeing a lot more of that than we've ever seen before. So. Um, yeah, as Martin said, there's, um, there's, there are graphs in Moodle, they're spread out um, here and there, uh, but they haven't really been a focus. We did update all the graphs recently so that um, the data in the graphs is presented in a nicer way and you can actually go in and see the raw um, data that is behind each of the graphs that's generated in Moodle. So um, it's good that we've improved uh, that side of the API. Um, but uh, so now that API has been improved, um, it would be great to see people uh, sending it more 
plugins and putting more plugins in the pl database. There are actually quite a lot of um, plugins for generating dashboards and all different kinds of reports in the plugins database. But I understand that um, actually there is a challenge there where people sometimes can't install plugins on their own sites. Um, and also just the fact that there are so many plugins available, it's hard to go through it in the mall and see which ones are going to be useful to install um, and things like that. So uh, yeah, I, one thing that maybe we can do is we can go through the plugins database and uh, find the very popular, very useful plugins and look at adding those to core. Um, that might be a good use. And also um, uh, our uh, education team. So Elizabeth has gone through Moodle and identified a bunch of places where we could um, add some more reports uh, that would be really useful for people uh, to put them up front. Um, obviously, uh, there are other things like uh, IntelliBoard. Uh, it's something that you can just, you can plug in and they have great dashboards as well. Um, and so there's a lot of options uh, that people can install on their sites. But out of the box, uh, Moodle probably is quite a, a little bit bare on the reporting side. Um, yep. uh, you, you led me right onto what I was going to say, that there's a difference between reporting and analytics for me. I think uh, reporting is a subset of analytics, but analytics should, I think, go further. I mean, it's about the analysis. Uh, it's not just presenting data for you to anal analyse, although that's one part. Um, it should hopefully be doing some of that analysis and giving you uh, actionable feedback, some sort of feedback that you, you can take an action on. That's my definition, I would say. Um, anybody disagree? No, no, I was going to say similar. I mean, we, you take a graph and you look at that graph and you say, well, yeah, that's a nice graph. But then you look at the graph and you then say, wow, there's, there's four students out lying in, in that area there that, that is way out from the mean of where everyone else is there. There's something happening up there that I need to, to maybe do something about. That to me is the, analyst, the, the analytic part of where the reports and analytics kind of like fit together in my eyes. Um, and, and then like I said, the, the really important stuff is then doing something with that and, and, and being able to then, um, you know, reach out, uh, you know, can we, can we directly from that analytics reach out to that student who is in the outlier of that grass and click on him and say, um, we need to get together, we need to talk about this because there's a problem going on here somewhere. So it, I, I think it, it's always got to end in some sort of action that's going to bring about some sort of change. Well, that's not always, but but I think you know for the benefit of of the sort of work that we do with our students in retention and so forth, it's certainly key. Um, with Inspire, will you have any plans? So that's, I think, the main thing for me is that making something meaningful and having an action that's meaningful from the data because I think our teachers, they're really just overwhelmed, you know, so then they get all these reports. Like, we have a number of plugins like Gizmo, um, Inactive User Alert. I think we've got another one I can't remember off the top of my head. But then they've just got all of this data that they're freaking out about, <laughs> you know, they're like... They, there is this beautiful looking report, but what does it mean and when do they intervene? So I think um, from our perspective, it's really educating them on how to use that data and when might the points be. So I suppose my uh, question about Inspire is, will you have some sort of, I don't know, rollout plan or suggestions? I know that you probably don't want to direct people um, fully because it's all about what we make of it. But I think sometimes that would be really helpful, knowing what your intention was, you know, because we just get something and then we're like, what is the intention behind it, apart from having all this wonderful data? Well, I can tell you about the intention when we launched the project in, in my mind was that uh, the, the system is uh, creating events. So it's saying, something's happened, I'm going to notify somebody about it. Um, and we have a quite a, we have a messaging system in Moodle, and if you have the mobile app, they come through on your phone, uh, or on other, or email, or other devices, whatever. Um, but the intention was that you would get these notifications. Then, um, 
I, you obviously want to control them. And so we had talked about, I don't know how far away this is going to be, but um, some sort of a, a, a way of saying, oh, we actually do have this. You can say, I don't want any more of these, right? You can, you can kill them on the report page currently. Right? Yeah, it yeah, came in. Um, uh, you can say, so what happens is um, the teacher will uh, get a notification that an insight um, uh, has been predicted uh, and they'll see the details about like this student um, is at risk of uh, dropping out of a course um, and right there it'll have the data that was used to calculate that insight. So maybe they, um, uh, they haven't logged in for, or they haven't completed their profile, and but they did participate in the week one activities, but they haven't participated in the week two activities. Um, and then uh, from that insight, directly on that insight, you have a list of actions that can be taken. And those, uh, this is what we call a model, um, which we want. Uh, we've shipped this uh, students at risk of dropping out model in 3.4, and we want people to come up with the other models um, and contribute them back to Moodle so that we can all have all kinds of different uh, models in Moodle. But it's like the collection of the things that might be useful as um, indicators of something, and then uh, that's going to generate an insight, and part of the insight is the um, suggested actions that you might want to take from that insight. So in this case, the suggested actions um, could be uh, to go and look at the student's grades in the grade report or to send that student a message. Um, and you can also acknowledge uh, the, the insight to make it go away or you could say this wasn't actually useful. So when you say that the insight wasn't actually useful, um, that in itself becomes an indicator uh, back into the system, so it's like a feedback loop. Um, so the system is less likely to generate that kind of uh, insight in the future as well. Uh, where, where I would like to see that going is become like an assistant. So Moodle, this is what I was saying this morning, Moodle's like a voice talking to you in a chat basically and saying, hey, what about this? And you go, oh, stop telling me about that. Uh, or tell me more about those. Or stop bothering me at night. Or, you know, you adjust its behaviour and the assistant kind of learns what you want and, you, and you, it's like a slider bar, you're adjusting the sensitivity of it until it's just what you need. The, I think that seems to be the kind of interface anybody could uh, learn to use without any training, right? It would just be something you would just learn uh, by doing it. You just following up on that, that's a very good analogy, Martin. So what sort of my perception of those sort of challenges as well, let's draw it to something that's more of an outdated existence, which is you know running a, a, a managed services company and getting support requests and escalation requests that sort of come in through the front door and we have to deal with those. The, the successful, uh, when things are running badly, there's too much noise. There's too much noise, it's coming all the time, there's too many things coming to too many people, you're not really sure which, what you're absolutely expected to deal with and what you're not, and there's a lot of, um, there is effort and process around uh, optimising the way in which those that messaging is directed, um, how it is structured, and what the expectations are around action and resolution, right? Um, I mean, a great example is when you're monitoring systems, for example, for if they break or if they fail automated tests. I mean, you, you, the perfect monitoring system is one that you never get alerts from, right? That's the perfect monitoring system, but in reality, and, and the very bad monitoring system is one that there's so many alerts that you just look at the, you look at the wall and there's all these alerts and you go, oh yeah, I'm not even sure which ones I need to bother about because hey, that one's been read for two weeks and oh, someone's going to fix that one and all that. So, I mean, that's and that's a reality and I've we, we've had those systems before. So, I mean, you an assistant's a great way of looking at it. I mean, the, often my um, some of my great team members, because I'm not very good at being organised about anything to do other than sort of IT stuff, and if they come and ask me questions all the time, then I just give them random answers about what to do. But if we can sit down for an hour every couple of days and work through things, and I don't have to think about those things at all outside of that, then we have much more sensible decisions getting made, and, and that's because you need to sort of get in the, in the mode of these things, and uh, working through, working through 
through these things in a concentrated way, but not being overwhelmed and not context shifting and having clear definitions of who is supposed to, and I never say care about this, but who's, whose responsibility it is and what the expectation is around taking actions. And, and also talking amongst yourselves and saying, there's too much. It's too much. Like, there's no, there's no value in us as an organisation getting 50 notifications every Monday about things we've got to do because we simply don't have time. So we need to, we need to change the way things get escalated, uh, so that perhaps things need to go to a higher level before, before we're expected. Maybe the first step is you just send emails to the to the student saying, oh, "Not good enough." It doesn't come to us where our actual involvement and action is required until it hits a higher, a higher level, for example, right? But th and those are decisions that need to be made organisationally and they some, some of them aren't easy and some of them don't necessarily align with what the business expectations are compared to what the resourcing um, might be available. Um, Martin alluded in, your, in the keynote this morning to you know, future technologies or, or technologies that are with us now in AI and so forth and I know that some work that we're doing at the moment around um, IBM Watson, I think many of you might be familiar with IBM Watson as the computer that <coughs> beat the chess champion and, and so forth and there's, there's Watson projects going on in, in many of the universities in Australia and around the world. Um, many of you might be familiar with Deakin University's student support uh, environment. Students actually don't talk to a student advisor at Deakin, they talk to Watson and Watson gives the answers back. So it trolls through all of the data and it comes back with a search that, that's been modified and, and presents the, uh, the student with the answers. And those answers might be, uh, look, it sounds like you need to talk to a student advisor. Click here to create a, a calendar invite to a student advisor. So we've started some work with a number of universities around this concept of a nudge, okay, and, 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 and mobile driven, but the ability to nudge a student or nudge an advisor or nudge a teacher or nudge an administrator based on uh, the, the, the communication that a student would have with Watson. And so, you know, the student will, will, will ask questions via the phone or, or, or some other mechanism. And then, uh, you know, Watson will then determine who should be nudged as a result of that. And it may be that the question, the student says, look, I'm really struggling in this subject. I don't know really what I've, you know, how I can, how I can see myself getting to the end of this subject without failing. What am I going to do? You know, Watson comes back with some options. The student continues to have that conversation and then it leads to some sort of actions about getting that student in front of a guidance counsellor or the lecturer or whatever is the case and, and, and therefore informs those people as part of that whole particular process. So I'm really excited. I've seen some sort of introductory work on that that we're doing. Um, I'm, I'm really excited to see where that goes. Um, it may not be Watson, it may be some other AI, te AI technology that, that, that leads that way but, but it's really exciting because the computing power needed to manage and troll through all of that data, you know, is is not something that's that's available to us in our in, in our typical server structures and stuff we have in our organisations. So, you know, we're needing tools like like that to, to be able to troll through, you know, gigabytes, terabytes of, of, of data to, to get those answers back for us. I went to a presentation today uh, where Mike from Catalyst was showing uh, this really great little use of uh, Watson and great little use of sentiment analysis. And he was picking up data from forums and uh, just simply indicating what some of the overwhelming feeling was in those forums, whether it was negative, whether it was positive, whether it was full of disgust, you know, and, and, and I, I think that kind of nudge-nudge, um, um, <laughs> your class finds this disgusting, you know, is, is, is really interesting and, and, and useful and, and uh, a thoughtful application of, of uh, some of that technology. So Mike at Catalyst, it was great. Hi guys, uh, Zach here from uh, CT in uh, Perth. Um, I have a question which is kind of specific about Inspire, um, and one is more more broader about your thoughts. Uh, my question is: uh, Is any of the data that's collected through the Inspire, let's say, machine learning engine, is any of this data shared with a third party like Google or anyone else who uses uh, 
that technology. Um, is that stored locally on the server? Because again, I, I don't know all the details and how this works. I'm not an expert in the area. And uh, the second more broader question is, uh, what are your thoughts on, on data privacy, something that Martin talked about this morning? Where is the line between collecting enough data in order to make those uh, processes, machines better and keeping that privacy? So uh, I would like to hear your thoughts on this. So uh, about the... Um, first part of the question about where does the data go. Uh, so with Project Inspire, um, it's all run on your Moodle server. So um, it comes with uh, a choice of two uh, machine learning backends initially, um, and we can add more in future. Um, one is TensorFlow, um, which is the, the Google machine learning library. Uh, but it doesn't actually go to Google servers at all. It's a, a Python library that you install on your Moodle server. So there might be challenges for some people installing things on their Moodle server. The other option is uh, PHP machine learning, um, which is uh, a PHP library for a similar thing. And that just, uh, you don't, there's no installation requirements for that one, so um, anybody could use that. But again, all of the data is kept on your Moodle server and processed on your Moodle server, so it's not shared with anyone. In terms of data privacy, um, there are some uh, implications. Uh, just So it depends on what um, whether this is enabled and what kind of actions are being the data is being used for. Um, but it, it's good if you have a site privacy policy to tell people if their data is going to be used in this way uh, to generate things and what those things might be used for. I know as part of the um, EU uh, general data privacy regulation changes that are coming up next year, that's one of the requirements is that um, you need to tell everybody, not just students, but you need to tell people when their data is going to be processed and what it's going to be processed for um, and give them the choice to uh, opt out of having their data processed and what the implications of opting out uh, might mean as well. And that's clearly a challenge with any analytics going forwards. Uh, so, yeah, I don't know if, if anyone has got any, um, has anyone had a special interest or looked into this kind of question before here and wants to add their two cents? But uh, I think it's a problem we all need to solve. Um, and in the Inspire case, um, the research forum that we have around it is exactly the place to discuss these issues and bring that research together and best practice. So yeah, it's a, it's a complicated one, this one. So we, we're actually being directly affected by the, the new EU rules uh, because, well, we're in the process of understanding what this means because of the way we've implemented our Follow the Sun support for Moodle. Uh, so we have a team in the UK, a team in Australia and a team in New Zealand, and we watch each other's uh, Moodles uh, in the, when one person is awake and the other one is sleeping, pretty simply. And this, these new regulations have implications in the details around really what the definition of access and data, even though data isn't moving around. So it's, 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 it's an ongoing challenge um, and from someone, and I've been quite in quite a few discussions around privacy and data sovereignty and those sorts of things with various clients and understanding what contractual uh, obligations you're getting into. And what I will say is, is that if you have a lawyer, a commercial person and a technical person sitting around the room talking privacy, they might as well be speaking different languages, right? Like it is complicated, so do not think for a second that you're, that maybe because you haven't had a lot to do with these these things before that you are not qualified to ask any question and there is no such thing as a silly question in these things because it is complicated and different people have different takes on it and 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 also and I hate to say this but from some angles it's sort of a little bit absurd as well I mean some of the some of the requirements uh, are too much and some of them are just broadly ignored um, but it is something to be paying attention to because the failure in an organisation will be, you know, if data ends up in the place it shouldn't be and something bad happens, the failure will be because people weren't asking questions, because people didn't go through, because your, your inability to demonstrate that you went through a process of asking questions and reviewing implications and just sort of saying, look, we were paying attention, um, is what will be the downfall. Uh, that's, it's sort of like a compliance challenge. but. 
It is, it is not, I mean, my personal take on it and our, our perception of it is there are some quite curly challenges here and, you know, hopefully it'll get easier. Yeah, and I think, you know, with the move to the cloud, for, for any application, it, it brings with it a whole lot of new challenges that we never had when we were running our Moodle, you know, in the back office in, in, uh, on the campus or whatever, and that data wasn't really going any further than, than that particular environment. So you're right, um, you know, get a good lawyer if you're concerned and, 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 and work your way through it. Uh, there's, there's not only is there the EU, re EU regulations, there's FedRAMP in the US, there's, there's uh, a whole range of Australian, uh, we've just gone through a massive uh, workload with Singapore government, which has got the tightest privacy registration of any organisation in the world. Um, when we brought five polytechnics together in in one environment, with with a whole suite of, you know, there were twelve layers of security protocols beneath each other just to get to the data um, and, and so forth. And and you have to meet both hardware-wise as well as software-wise each of those um, and get signed off and all that sort of stuff. So, you know, it, it's it's only going to get worse than it's going to get easier, I think, as, as we move uh, and, and when we get a Moodle cloud and all that sort of stuff, there's going to be implications around that as we have people from all around the world accessing those Moodle clouds as well and, and where that data is going to live and move and, and all that sort of thing. So, One thing I will say, though, is you've got a much better chance of solving these with open software than anything else. Just from a, um, an everyday, everyday user kind of a perspective, perhaps um, what the lady said earlier, which was uh, that there's an interim step since it's going to take a wee while for this to, to come on board. It would be nice to have more data, um, like with from a, from assessments like um, quiz and assignments. We would like to see more data come out of rubrics, marking guides, and things like that, which we're currently not able to get. get Get, um, get a hold of, and having that data would be much more, uh, it would probably drive our decisions and what we actually deliver as opposed to more, and then be able to act on the students. So we're not getting any data out on how good our assessments are, because it's all buried in marking guides and rubrics, and, and quizzes and quiz types. So will we end up being able to have a, an assessment database and have the analysis of that sort of thing as well? So where are you getting it out to? Are you pulling it out of the database yourself? Well, that's the thing is we can't get access to that. So there's no access to all the data that from all our rubrics and marking guides from our assignments. And that's really rich data which we could um, no, So no access from what? Within Moodle itself, so in the, from the front end, we can't get to that unless we were, went in the back end of the database. Does that make sense? Um, so when you use rubrics and market guides, uh, and you, once you fill them out, um, what it does is it then generates a score, and the score is the thing that goes in the gradebook. Um, That's correct. So what I understand you're trying to say is that you don't actually, uh, from the gradebook, for example, you can't then go and see the breakdown of the rubric or the marking guide that made up that individual score, or see like aggregated data about um, the first uh, question in this marking guide. Most students uh, got a two out of five, and um, maybe there's a that that topic wasn't actually covered in the course material or something like yeah, that. Yeah, or every yeah, or particular whole parts of the syllabus are done poorly by the students, so we should you know address that issue. Yeah, no. I mean it sounds like a fair comment. Um, some places in Moodle do give that kind of data and uh, when the, the competencies um, changes that we uh, we added, uh, that does give you a sort of a report um, of a breakdown per competency of uh, perhaps things that aren't being completed by students and things like that. Um, but uh, I think, yeah, for, for marking guides and rubrics that does seem to be uh, something that we don't do. Great. Yep. Yes. Um, UTS has a, a room uh, dedicated to analytics called the Data Arena. It's a physical room that you go into and you put on some goggles and you get presented vast data sets. 
and you can actually engage with them uh, in a very tangible way, moving your hands, and also the goggles give you almost like a virtual reality experience. Do you think there's any scope for bringing um, virtual reality and analytics together with Moodle? Well, I mean, it sounds awesome. Sounds like my NOI report. Oh, just on that, I saw a, I saw it slightly segueing, but I think it's relevant. I, I was driving through, I was walking through Sydney here yesterday, and there was a big ad on on the side of a bus for I cannot remember the university, with one of the university, with a person standing there in, in reality glasses and saying, "We have made accounting." <laughs> more exciting with VR. So if you can make accounting more exciting with VR, you can certainly make analytics. So it's, the problem's been solved by someone, they just need to adjust it a bit, I think. I, I, I don't know how they've done it, though. I don't believe them. I, <laughs> <laughs> um, look, you, you won't find a much bigger fan of VR than me here. Uh, we, have, we have a VR room at Moodle HQ, and we, I have one at home as well. And uh, I have had since the Vive came out, so for quite a while. However, I don't think it's useful here. Uh, for the computers should be doing the analysis in my... It, I, I, would, I would love to boil it down, like I said, to just little messages, like the, get the computer doing the work. Um, I think throwing heaps of data, no matter how fun, at people is not, it's not practical. Um, It's, I think AR is where it's going to get very interesting, but again, you don't want all that data overlaid on your life. <laughs> I think um, one other important bit of analytics or bit of data that we're missing, and, and I talked about it in, in my session, and it's something that I know we all deal with, but we don't think of the importance of as, that, as it relates to retaining students and so forth, is what we call week zero data. So it's the data that you know about a student before they even start, you know, first in family, ethnicity, um, where they've come from, are they mature students, are they undergraduates, or, or did, they, did they finish in year 10, all of that sort of stuff. And I think when you start to meld that data with their learning data, the, the actual meaningfulness of, 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 of that is much greater. So I think you, know, you need to be looking at systems that are bringing not only the data that's being generated out of Moodle, but adding into that, that other data, because it can tell you so much. There is a lot of historical data out there, and there's a lot of things that we know about students from where they come from and where they lived and, and, and all those sorts of things. And I think we can learn a hell of a lot from that. Now, that data is sitting in your student management system. It's a case of bringing those two together. And it'd be great you know, if, if Inspire had some mechanism of bringing those two things together. Starts getting, starts getting creepy though, doesn't it? <laughs> it does. Yeah, I was just going to comment that that does, once you do start doing things like that, um, uh, that does bring a lot more privacy concerns in. So if you start um, predicting that um, uh, females are more likely to pass the maths test than males and you send an alert to all the males and things like that, uh, <laughs> it might, might be a problem. But it's actually uh, ac mentioned in the EU data privacy regulations, if you start processing that class of data, that's classed as highly um, uh, private data, and then it has flow-on implications for uh, uh, your reporting and how long you can keep the data and the kinds of things that you need to mention in your privacy policy when you're communicating that data to your users. So um, there are a lot of, uh, uh, you have to tread very carefully. <coughs> Well, it brings the other aspect of minority report in, which was that he was accused of crimes he hadn't done yet. So, you know, our university is going to start, uh, you know, cutting students, go, oh, we know you're going to fail. Hey, I haven't, I haven't failed yet. Like, is, you know. <laughs> I mean, it's an extreme example, but, uh, like, are we, pre are, we pre are we not giving people a chance also? Are we close to time? All right. Getting the, getting the wind up, probably last question down here. Um, is there going to be any facility with the Inspire to be able to add in information about once the student has left or completed a course and you can feed that in and see where they've gone on for work purposes or gone to other courses or any of that kind of thing so that you can get that more longitudinal information, anything like that? Well, it's designed as a, an API and a platform for um, everybody to uh, send us 
examples of things that we want to feed into this engine in future. Um, so no, not at the moment, um, but that is the intention uh, that people can come up with suggestions for things that might be useful and send it to us and get it incorporated into the system. Yep. I'm hoping in a year that we'll, we'll be seeing dozens of analytics plugins for Inspire that, that take it in different directions as you need to. Okay, I think we're at the end. Right. Oh. Thanks Damien, Tom, Martin, Rand, Andrew. Good on you. Cheers. Well.